um, at the San Francisco Public Library's virtual stage. Tonight, we are very excited to host five acclaimed queer mystery writers discussing their work and the mystery genre. I'm Kevin, I'm a librarian from the Jane C. Hormel LGBTQIA Center at the main library. And I'm going to start us off with some information about the library and introduce our authors. We do want to begin with a land acknowledgement. Welcome to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people. We acknowledge the many Wamutish Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands on which we reside. SFPL is committed to uplifting the names of these lands and community members from these nations with whom we live together. SFPL encourages you to learn more about first person culture and land rights and we are committed to hosting events and providing educational resources on these topics. And we want to highlight our Summer Stride program, which began about two weeks ago. Summer Stride is the library's annual summer learning, reading and exploration program for all ages and abilities. Reading for just 20 hours over the summer gets you one of our much sought after Summer Stride tote bags, which you can see in the slide here. Go to our website or check the chat box for a link with all the details on Summer Stride. And I want to update you on a few upcoming Pride Month events. On June 17th, Sarah Schulman will be here to discuss her latest book, Let the Record Show, A Political History of ACT UP New York. 1987 to 1993. On June 22nd, Tom Amiano will be here to discuss his recent memoir, Kiss My Gay Ass, My Trip Down the Yellow Brick Road Through Activism, Stand Up, and Politics. On June 28th, we have a book club featuring Brian Terrence Purnell's 100 Boyfriends. 100 Boyfriends is our Pride Month on the same page selection. You can join your fellow library patrons to discuss the book. And we want to thank the NorCal chapter of Mystery Writers of America for co-sponsoring this event. They are one of 11 regional chapters of the Mystery Writers of America, the country's oldest organization of professional mystery writers. They welcome traditionally published, self-published and aspiring writers people in related professions, and simply those who love crime fiction. And now on to the main events. I am going to introduce the authors, and I want to thank our authors for joining us from a variety of time zones. We have the Eastern, Central, Mountain, and Pacific time zones covered this evening. So if you're on the East Coast, thank you for staying up late tonight. And I will introduce the authors. Michael Nava is our moderator this evening. Michael is the author of an acclaimed series of eight novels featuring gay Latino criminal defense lawyer Henry Rios, who the New Yorker called a detective unlike any previous protagonist in American noir. The New York Times Book Review has called Nava one of our best writers. His most recent Rios novel is Lies with Man which was published in April by Amble Press, an LGBT press and imprint of Bywater Books, of which he is also managing editor. His award-winning historical novel, The City of Palaces, set at the beginning of the 1910 Mexican Revolution, was published in September 2020 by Amble Press. Cheryl A. Head writes the Charlie Mack Motown Mystery Series, which includes Bury Me When I'm Dead, shortlisted for the 2017 Lambda Literary Award. Catch Me When I'm Falling, a finalist for the 2020 Next Generation Indie Book Award. And Judge Me When I'm Wrong, finalist for the Goldie Award and winner of the 2020 Golden Crown Literary Society's Ann Bannon Popular Choice Award. Her debut novel, Long Way Home, a World War II novel, was a double finalist for the 2015 Next Generation Indie Book Award. In 2019, Head was inducted into the Saints and Sinners Hall of Fame. 
Greg Heron is the award-winning author of over 30 novels and 50 short stories. He is also an award-winning editor with over 20 anthologies to his credit and an Anthony Award. His next book, Bury Me in Shadows, will be released in October of 2021. He is also currently serving as Executive Vice President of Mystery Writers of America. Dharma Kelleher, author of the Jinx Baloo Bounty Hunter series and the Shea Stevens Outlaw Biker series, writes action-driven thrillers that explore the complexities of society and criminal justice in a world that favors the privileged. She is one of the only openly transgender authors in the crime fiction genre. And PJ Vernon has been called a rising star thriller writer by Library Journal. Vernon's debut, When You Find Me, was both an Audible Plus number one listen and Associated Press top 10 US audiobook. His next novel, Bathhouse, pitched as Gone Girl with Gays and Grinder, was released just today from Doubleday. So perfect timing on that. And I am now ready to turn it over to our moderator, Michael Nava. So I will stop sharing my screen. Hi there. So uh, let me start by thanking uh, the San Francisco Public Library and Kevin in particular for helping to organize this and for being so um, generous and helpful in putting it together. And to call out the Mystery Writers of America NorCal chapter and Claire Johnson, its president, who was an avid supporter of this panel. And uh, I'm also on the uh, NorCal MWA board of directors and I encourage anyone who has an interest in crime fiction to join us because we do have a lot of very interesting programs, including craft programs throughout the year. In fact, I think next month I'm leading um, a, a program on point of view. So um, I better get cracking. <laughs> so, uh, and I wanna begin by um, uh, mentioning that two of our writers have just published books. Uh, Dharma's book, Turf Wars came out earlier this week. And uh, today is PJ's pub day. So bravo, PJ. Um, I wanted to start by asking about your coming out. When did you come out as a writer? And did that have any, uh, was there any relation between your coming out as a writer and your coming out as a queer person? And since it's uh, his big day, let's start with PJ. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to San Francisco Public Library for having me um, and, and, and Michael for organizing this and hanging out with y'all. It's, it it's an emotional day and I've been barely lucid um, for all of it. So I apologize. I also have ADHD and by now medicine is offline. <laughs> so all that coming together, I'm gonna try to be lucid. But um, as far as uh, coming out goes, um, I was closeted um, the entire time I lived in. I grew up in a small town in South Carolina, um, which was very conservative, uh, with very conservative uh, conservative community and, and family, um, and went to a Christian private school, um, which was kind of a, a way to, to keep schools segregated uh, uh, down there when, when I look at the population breakdown. Um, and uh, and so, no, it, it didn't feel safe uh, uh, for me to um, necessarily be out. And I spent a lot of time uh, trying to make myself not gay different ways or, or celibate if I, if I could have managed that as well. Um, and having a lot of um, uh, screwed up thoughts uh, along those lines. Um, and actually I didn't come out all the way until the end of uh, college where I, I went to college there because it was cheaper and a scholarship there would have covered everything versus somewhere else. Um, and so I, I went to grad school um, in Pittsburgh. Um, and when I moved there, I, I felt like I could, um, I could be me. Uh, and, and so that's what I did. Um, as far as you know, coming out in terms of being a writer, um, I always was out as a writer because I'm also uh, a late 
bloomer, so to speak. I had a totally different career before I became a writer. Um, and, you know, uh, by the time I took, took my dream seriously and, and wrote a, broke enough books to be able to write one that was okay enough for folks to buy, um, I was okay telling folks, you know, who I am and, and all those sorts of things. But it's been a little bit different uh, this go around because this is the first time I um, wrote a book with centered on queer characters um, like myself. I didn't do that um, before this book because I was scared shitless that no one would buy it. And I, I was naive. I, you know, I didn't have access to, uh, there wasn't a gay bookstore down the street. Uh, for me growing up, there was Walmart. Um, and if there was a book on the Walmart bookshelves, that's what I had access to. Um, and so uh, this is actually, today is the first day uh, that a uh, book that I wrote that that I was able to draw on my own lived experiences in a way that a lot of authors do um, for theirs uh, was published. So it's, I kind of feel in a, in a way that's different from what, what you mean, perhaps that it's almost like today is kind of a coming out um, in a way. Um, and I, it's not my debut, but I think it's better. It's be doing something a lot better than a debut. Um, and so I'm happy to be here uh, and I wouldn't want to be in any other city <laughs> and, and with any other folks uh, tonight. So thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, for PJ. Uh, Dharma. Okay. You're there muted. I'm unmuted. Yeah. Muted. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I came out as a writer when I was a teenager. Um, I had dreams of becoming the next Lawrence Block or something like that, next to Grafton. Uh, and this is back in the early or late late seventies, early eighties, um, when I was a teenager, and then um, uh, and so I went to college to get uh, I I got a degree in journalism, hoping to that I could use that to still launch a uh, novel writing career. But as I was in college, um, the other part of myself started wanting to come out. Uh, as far as uh, my gender identity. Um, back then in the late 80s, I really didn't have the language to describe myself as being transgender. I didn't know anyone else that was, you know, the closest I, you know, you'd hear um, jokes on sitcoms talking about Christina Jorgensen, ha 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 ha. And um, so for the longest time, I, well, for a few years, I thought, well, I met, just must be a, an effeminate, effeminate gay man. So, um, and when I was struggling with, with all of my sexuality and gender identity, all of my writing took a back seat because I just had to figure out who the heck I was. Mm. And um, so I lived for a few years thinking I was a gay man and then um, Caroline Cossey did a, a spread in a, uh, a men's magazine. I don't remember if it was Playboy or Pen Penthouse or something like that. Not one that I normally picked up, but um, she did. And that was when I realized who and what I was. And so um, it wasn't until decades later, um, when I was in my 40s, that I got back into writing, that I'd finally transitioned and started to build a new life uh, that I finally felt comfortable enough in my own skin to start writing again. And that was, we're talking 2007. So from uh, the early 80s to um, the mid 2000s, no writing. So I kind of had to, I was in the closet as a writer. <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, I, even with my writing, I first started out, um, I wouldn't, I didn't have the courage to write about a trans protagonist, especially not in crime fiction. Um, so I started off writing about a lesbian uh, protagonist because I was living in a same sex relationship. And um, I had trouble getting that um, published. You know, I, I got a, an agent, but then we kept hearing, oh, we've already uh, published a trans, or, you know, we, we've already published a, a lesbian uh, crime uh, story this year, so we're not really looking. We like the story, but we don't know how to market it, you know, the, the usual. So um, after after first two books, I finally had the courage to come out 
as a trans author writing trans stories, trans crime fiction. So it was a very long drawn out journey. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Cheryl, what, what about you? But, well, you know, why, I, um, so why don't we all, let's all unmute so that we can ask each other questions. Oh, <laughs> good idea. And feel, free, and feel free to, <laughs> sorry. So I um I had a whole life before I I knew I was gay, but I still had another whole life. I was married to a man and had a child in Detroit, and it wasn't until I came to Washington D.C. that I uh, was out at work and with my family. So um, the the writing itself it's a, a kind of the same story. I was writing a lot of stuff that was not fiction. I was working in public media, so I'm writing scripts and writing proposals and reports to Congress when I moved to Washington. So my writing really morphed into fiction after I, I moved to DC. And the first book I wrote, I didn't have any queer protagonists until I was almost done with it. And one of the characters whispered in my ear at, at dawn, you know I'm gay, right? <laughs> so that was my first I book and my first introduction that my either my subconscious or my characters were shaking me into consciousness about writing queer characters. And then when I started doing the Charlie Mack series, uh, my publisher at Bywater Books, um, I, I, I'd self-published uh, a version of that, that mystery online. And um, she came up to me and said, I'm one of those traditional noir writers where I don't think um, a lot of sex belongs in noir. So I didn't have romance scenes. And, and she came up to me and said, do you think Charlie could be a lesbian? And I said, well, yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and then it turns out all my beta readers thought she was a lesbian anyway. So it was really easy to make, make good. So. And so Greg, you published 30 books. So you started writing when you were like right out of the womb, right? Pop out of the womb yeah, with a typewriter. I um yeah i started right I, 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 I always knew i was ever going to be a writer when i was a kid it was the only thing i ever wanted to be because i learned how to read when i was like three years old and i was a little boy who played with dolls because i told stories with my sister's dolls she didn't care about her dolls at all she just <laughs> was given dolls and did nothing with them and my parents just thought i was weird <laughs> Been disappointing them since 1961. So, <laughs> so I knew, I also knew from a really, really young age that I wasn't into girls. I knew that, I mean, my, I can remember that very distinctly. Like, I don't want to get, I don't want to get married. I don't want to, I don't want a wife. I don't want that. But in the 1960s, you know, there really wasn't like, well, I guess I'm going to have to do all of this stuff. I have to do this. I have to get, I have to go to college. I have to have a career. I have to have a wife. I have to have kids. We're from Alabama. So yeah, totally get it. PJ. <laughs> <laughs> but I've lived in pretty much every conservative place in the country that you could possibly live with the possible, with the exception of Chicago. My childhood was in Chicago. We moved to Chicago when I was really young, but when I was a teenager, we moved to rural Kansas. Mm -hmm. I went from a high school, a suburban high school with like 1800 students to a high school with 180 students. And that was scarring. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I had, I always felt like I was the only one. And I remember there was a little bookstore in the county seat that I used to go to all the time. And I found the front runner there in Gordon Merrick's books and was always very, very hungry for that kind of representation. And there really wasn't much. And so I started, we moved to California when I was 19, Fresno, AKA Topeka. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Kansas, 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 California wasn't really much of a choice, and so I left college there and went to California, and I started feeling my way out of the closet, trying to figure out how I could deal with it, how to deal with my parents, my incredibly right-wing evangelical Southern parents, oh, yeah. and knowing that it would not go well. <laughs> And then, you know, I, it's really hard to say, talk about it, but, you know, people started dying. Yeah. 
and like all the people all the people i knew when i first started inching my way out of the closet started getting sick and started dying and fresno there was no internet back then there wasn't much cable really not like there is now and we weren't san francisco we weren't new york we weren't los angeles we weren't you know any major center so there wasn't really there wasn't really any information about hiv and aids and i was watching my friends the people i'd connected with die and basically well this is what's this is my future i'm going to get sick i'm going to get die we don't know how this is spreading etc 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 so i was also doing the pj thing of like how can i not be gay what can i do to not be gay mm -hmm. and so my 20s were a wasted decade really where i was afraid to do anything and i was afraid to be myself and i was afraid to embrace what i wanted out of life and then then i moved away from Cal i left california finally in 1989 and moved to houston and that's where i got the airline job we were talking about earlier <laughs> and uh, surprise gay people everywhere <laughs> <laughs> but i was still afraid I was still very, very, very afraid, but I started coming out, inching my way out a little bit more. I finally officially started coming out to my friends and my college friends and all the people that I had never been honest with before when I was in about 30, in 1991, when I was about 30. And then about three years later, I was tired of being miserable and I was tired of being unhappy and I was, I hated my job. I hated my life. I hated everything about it. And I was like, I'm not going to be this way anymore. I don't want to live this. I'm going to die anyway. We all die anyway. And I would much rather die having enjoyed my life and doing things that I want to do and, and finding love and having friends and writing books and doing, following my dreams. And so when I was 33, I made a significant change in my life and I decided to start pursuing everything that I wanted to pursue in life. And that's when I met my partner, started writing, started getting my life together. And then I was really, <laughs> then we moved to New Orleans because we were also having a long distance relationship, PJ, and we met in New Orleans and we moved to New Orleans. Eventually we moved to New Orleans. So I moved to the city I love, with the man I love and now I get to do the work that I love. So I'm, you know, pretty happy, but my first, and I also, my partner got a job with the Tennessee Williams literary festival when we first moved about two years after we moved here. And then all of a sudden I was going to literary, there was a literary, I was as the partner of the assistant director, I was Mr. Volunteer 16 hour days for five days. And I started meeting writers and celebrities and it was really interesting and i met a writer named julie smith who i was a huge fan of mystery writer named julie smith and i was also a personal trainer at the time and she wanted to get in shape and i wanted to be a writer <laughs> so we traded services i trained her and she was my editor and she taught me how to write crime novels and she had walked me through the whole process how to get an agent how to do all of this and but i'm not very patient so when my first book was finished, it was a starter book. Murder in the Rudolphine was a spark starter book. It was a practice book. It was not, we, neither one of us thought it would ever be published. I sent it to three agents and the first two agents were very polite. They didn't know how to sell a gay book. And, mm -hmm. and you know, that was fine. And then this, <laughs> the third agent, the third agent, and now in retrospect, I realize it was a mistake but at the time i didn't know it was a mistake because it, it, i just thought it was mean so basically the agent had read my manuscript and then scribbled on a piece of paper and given it to their assistant to send back to me with a rejection letter she just put it in the envelope with his note <laughs> and mailed it back to me and the note was just like the characters are neither interesting or compelling no one will publish this and I was like, an a literary agent used neither or. <laughs> <laughs> and so in that same day, it. ironically, ironically, I had submitted, I'd been told I was a book reviewer for a gay publication in New Orleans at the time and got to know the publicist at Allison Books. And he told, had told me that I should submit stories to their anthologies because that would get my name in front of their editors. Even if they didn't use them, they would recognize my name. 
And that very day when I got home in a rage from the post office was <laughs> with this manuscript with this nasty note, I had an email from the editor-in-chief at Allison Books buying my story, a story I had submitted. And I just wrote him right back, said, would you be interested in a gay mystery set in New Orleans? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, yes, send it to me. And I sent that exact same manuscript to him and they bought it three weeks later. And that's how I got hey, started. Fantastic. And to this day, I don't have an agent. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I want to uh, ask you all then to introduce your books and your characters. Um, and um, Petey, let's start again with uh, you. Tell us a little bit about Bathhouse, which is getting incredible um, attention from Here all over is. the place, including the Post, <laughs> the Post of the New York Times. So tell us a little bit about the book. <clears throat> Absolutely. It, um, like you said, it's pitched as Gone Girl with Gaze and Grinder. Uh, the, the novel's about a young gay man, Oliver Park, um, who comes from um, a conservative uh, evangelical community, um, well, not necessarily evangelical the way, you know, Greg, you and I would <laughs> maybe understand <laughs> that um, in South Carolina, but a, a conservative uh, community nonetheless um, in, in Indiana. Um, and before the book starts, uh, he has hit a rock bottom um, because he is in a situation in a community where um, if he is himself, it's dangerous. Um, and, you know, of course, we, we're human and, and we're going to try to be ourselves however we can within, you know, the space that we're provided. And so he uh, had got into relationships and things that weren't great or um, were uh, uh, transgressive uh, to the society there. And that that sort of shame and layer of taboo um, that is internalized. Uh, resulted in all sorts of things that didn't have to be that way. But but before the book opens, he um, is is in a, a place where he can finally make some positive changes and be pointed sort of in the right direction. And he happens to meet uh, his husband, um, Dr. Nathan Klein, who is an older uh, trauma surgeon who comes from uh, New York uh, and and doesn't hasn't had the sorts of experiences that Oliver has and comes from a very priv privileged uh, background with money and um, and all sorts of things that Oliver uh, has never had access to. And so the whole book opens where uh, he's on the cusp of making an epic mistake um, by visiting a bathhouse uh, to, to cheat um, on his husband. Um, and things go very, very, very wrong and get very dangerous very quickly. Um, and then the novel kicks off with, with him desperate um, to hide uh, what happened um, there from his husband um, for, for a whole host of different reasons, not the least of which is because uh, it's, you know, he's lost, con he's, he's lost control. He's, he's a victim of a traumatic incident in, in a place where um, he's feeling shame, uh, you know, leaving mm -hmm. and, and a place where you could be almost murdered um, and, and not want to tell anyone about it, uh, which is a reality for, for a lot of folks. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the book. And uh, an abducted dog. An abducted, an abducted dog. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the, the interesting thing about the dog is when, he, when one of the characters is on the brink of death, they think about the dog and hoping the dog has water in the toilet. So <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of weird to you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, God help me if I've ever tried to write like, you know, a missing person or a person that's abducted or I'm always like, well, where is my heart? <laughs> so, like, that's what I think. If I, I, we were talking about hating flying, you know, it's like if there's turbulence or something. I'm just like, who's going to take care of my dog? That's all I'm, all I'm thinking about. The whole I, time. I, I have my cats as my screensaver. On the <laughs> so, so Dharma, talk about turf. We're starting with um, the acronym turf for those. Uh, people in our audience who may not yeah, uh, turf, know what that means. Yeah, TURF is uh, acronym T-E-R-F, not T-U-R-F. Uh, and TURF stands for trans-exclusive or no, trans-exclusionary uh, radical feminist. It's basically, uh, we back about a, a decade or so, uh, as the radical feminist movement became very popular, um, uh, 
and uh, trans people started to make their presence known. Um, the radical feminist community was somewhat divided. A lot of them were very inclusive. They said, you know, trans women are women, welcome to the sisterhood, you know. And then there was there were the others, uh, like those that organized the Michigan Women's Music Festival, uh, that did not do not consider uh, people like me to be women. They think that trans women are delusional men that are out to prey on cisgender women, and that um, uh, transgender men are failed lesbians, and so they just they just have this whole thing going on. And um, it's a story that had been in the back of my mind for quite a while. And then when uh, a certain popular uh, young adult fantasy writer, uh, who I shall not name, uh, began oh. embracing turf philosophy uh, and spewing hateful turf rhetoric, and then came out with a book where the uh, main character is a man that hide or dresses in women's clothing in order to prey on cisgender women, which is just feeding into these false, negative, harmful tropes. Meanwhile, trans women, especially trans women of color, are being murdered at all time high rates. And so I just got to a point where I said, I, I have to write this story. And uh, this is the fourth book in the Jinx Baloo series. Jinx Baloo is a transgender woman. She transitioned years earlier. Uh, she works as a professional bounty hunter. When people jump bail or have their bail revoked, she gets hired to pick them up and return them to custody. That's her job. And uh, she's also into comic books and uh, cosplays at conventions. And she's got a nerdy side to her. So she's a very three-dimensional character. And in this story, uh, she's getting ready to get married. She's uh, uh, heading out to her um, uh, bachelorette party in Vegas. And uh, she's assigned to uh, apprehend a woman that uh, is charged with murdering a transgender woman in a public restroom. Mm. And suddenly she, uh, Jinx is putting, ready to put all of her plans on hold because she knows that she needs to get this woman. Um, and so uh, the story is an exploration of a lot of the harmful rhetoric that is uh, being spewed. It's also an action thriller. I mean, it's, it's not like a, a lecture on gender identity or anything like that. This is a full on Hollywood action thriller with car chases and gunfights and murders and all kinds of craziness. But it also explores the idea of identity, intersectionality, um, uh, and the consequences of, uh, of actions and of rhetoric. Because you say, well, people should be able to say whatever they want to say. Well, words have consequences and they affect real human lives. And so that's kind of what I wanted to explore. I get into deep fake videos and media misinformation campaigns. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of ride that balance between action thriller and exploring some of these issues that are very personal to me. Mm -hmm. I, the inter one of the interesting things about Jinx is she's a very emotionally well-balanced Yes. I mean, she's not traumatized by having transitioned. No, um, not at all. And she in was... that sense, it's sort of different from some other Trans, trans fiction. Right? Yeah, um, she um, she was able to she she did have a kind of a crisis point when she was in middle school, but she when she did come out as transgender as a teenager, um, uh, her parents were accepting and helped to facilitate her transition. Mm -hmm. um, unlike me, where I am estranged from my family and have been for many many years. Uh, but um, yeah, she, so, and I, I wanted to, to show that, yes, I, I wanted to kind of normalize that accepting trans people for who they are is a, is a normal thing. It's not a big deal. It's not weird. In the same way that I, you know, I gave her a straight male boyfriend. 
Um, he's not gay. He's not bisexual. He's a straight man, but he's attracted to Jinx because Jinx is a woman. So I wanted to help normalize that aspect of it as well. Great. Um, Cheryl, tell us about Charlie Mack um, Motown. Yeah. <laughs> well, Charlie uh, Mack is a um, black queer um, private detective, female pri private detective in um, Detroit she, in the mid 2000s. Yeah. She's bisexual, if I, if, if I she, Yes, she is bisexual. She is choose the labels, so she doesn't call herself that. But clearly, in the first two books, that's kind of a, a, a storyline, a, a plot line. As the series progresses, I'm up to book six. She's entered a, a committed relationship with a woman that she loves, but she she is bisexual. Um, it, it's the stories are set in the mid 2000s in Detroit, which is a low point for Detroit. And I thought this was a good era to really talk about crime and greed and um, the, the 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 mayhem that could come with a city that is really on the brink of bankruptcy. Their mayor is being uh, investigated by the FBI. Um, you know, uh, Detroit is is um, always got its foot in the in in on the list of um, being the murder capital of the world. So it was a good time to really go in and look at all the um, the fraud and crime that was going on. Um, she is former Homeland Security and has left Homeland Security because she didn't like profiling of Muslims. She takes a couple of her fellow agents with her and now she runs a firm, a private investigation firm in Detroit. I, I, when, I, I'm, when I'm writing the books, I really don't want to write the same stuff. Um, so the first book is really a missing person case that goes awry, it takes me from Detroit to Alabama, um, Birmingham. The second book is a, more of a thriller. It looks at a threat, a domestic terrorist threat at the auto show, the third book looks at murder of homeless people, a serial killer who is killing homeless people. The, the fourth book gets a little more personal. It looks at um, Charlie on jury duty and there's some shenanigans going on in the courtroom. And so I'm always trying to kind of um, int keep myself interested in the series. Uh, the latest book is um, Warn Me When It's Time. Uh, it comes out in a couple of weeks, um, oh. June 29th. Uh, so I'm cool. happy to be able to show the book. And this one, I, I, this one I wrote, wrote and it's pretty topical. I, it's about the nascent activities of hate groups in Detroit, Michigan in the mid 2000s. So it's the first uh, term of the uh, Barack Obama. So it's early 2009. And at that time, the FBI has a report out that anyone can see that talks about the proliferation of hate groups during this time. People are just, their assassination attempts against Obama that are thwarted in the dozens. And so uh, when, when the, when the uh, governor of Michigan was threatened with kidnapping and murder by this group of people, I was curious about who these people were. And in this book, I talk about who these guys, mostly white men of all ages, of all stripes, from all professions, what's driving them, what's in their heads. And so I get in the head of at least one of these guys pretty good in first person point of view, young guy who's becoming self-radicalized and, and Charlie and her team um, intervene to find uh, the murder of a Muslim teacher. And in doing so, they upset the apple cart of several conspiracies that these hate crimes are, hate group, crime groups are involved in. Had fun writing it. It was a little sobering too at the same time. Yeah, I thought. Uh, it's scary. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Greg, Scotty. Ah, you want Scotty? I was wondering who you who, who you'd want. Well, okay. um, <laughs> well, you you choose who you want to talk about. Actually, uh, well, my most your... the most recent book that I have available is the Scotty book, so I'll I'll talk about that and then I'll plug the new one that's coming right. out later this year, if you don't mind. Oh, and I'm not looking away because I'm bored. It's because my cat, which is supposed to be who is supposed to be locked up, is not. <laughs> so I'm I'm trying to make sure he's not doing anything he's not supposed to be doing. Um, Royal Street Revion was the eighth Scotty book, and Scotty was originally supposed to be a one-off. It wasn't supposed to be a series. When I pitched the book to Kensington, they gave me a two-book contract, and I'll, I'll figure it out later. Um, but yeah, I'll take the money, please. Mm -hmm. Scotty was 
uh, kind of a reaction to writing Chance as my first series book. I wanted to write sex. Chance is not a, he's a darker character. He's a lot more, his, his background is a lot more similar to mine than I would probably like to admit publicly great. <laughs> and so he's a little more hard, hard boiled, darker series and so I wanted to write something light and funny and I had this great idea to it just seemed like a, it just seemed like it would be fun to write a book a thriller caper set during southern decadence in New Orleans which is like the gay Mardi Gras that takes place over Labor Day when thousands and thousands and thousands of queer people descend on New Orleans just to party and have a lot of fun mm. and, I, and I decided to make him a personal trainer slash stripper <laughs> because that made it even more fun and it was the whole idea was just to be funny and fun and have it and just be ridiculous and while I was writing that book my first the chance book came out and the first published review in a major newspaper basically that dismissed it as just another book full of gay stereotypes and I was like oh you want gay stereotypes do you? yeah <laughs> you asked for it and then scotty became really popular <laughs> and he's never been called a stereotype they've never dismissed a scotty book as a stereotype and so over the years he's kind of grown and because he kind of accidentally backed into a three-way relationship thruple i guess is what it's called now um with a former fbi agent and an international um I really don't really know how to describe what Colin is. He's kind of like a international agent, I guess, for hire. And so he disappears a lot. In, An international in, 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 man of mystery. Exactly. Nobody ever, knows, <laughs> nobody ever knows where he is or what he's doing because he can't tell them anything. And, and he just shows up, too. And he just shows up. He always shows up right in the nick of time. <laughs> he always shows up in the nick of time. And Royal Street Ravion, I wanted to do a book set during Christmas season in New Orleans. And Revion is a Christmas meal. It's traditionally, it's you fast all day on Christmas Eve and go to midnight mass. And then you have Revion after that, where you break the fast on Christmas morning at like two o'clock AM. But now people, it's, you just have it like, an, it's just dinner. <laughs> they, do, they do it all Christmas season and restaurants do it. And I was fascinated with um, reality television. I will admit to watching Real Housewives. Uh, shows. I and, knew that's what it was based on. <laughs> and I kind of, and my partner and I, he he makes fun of me for watching, but he knows who they all are. And, <laughs> and sometimes we would play a game while we were watching. It's like, well, if we did a Real Housewives of New Orleans, who would be, who would they have on the show? And we would come up with local people and it was we would just laugh and laugh and laugh. Like, I'm going to write about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write about that. And so that's kind of what the book is. It's um, there's a international intrigue aspect to it mm -hmm. because I don't plan these books. Scotty is a book that you can't plan. It just happens. And then I'd like, I'll be going, doing something funny and having fun with it. It's like, Oh, there's no mystery yet. I'll just have a body drop out of the sky from somewhere. And, <laughs> And I'll figure it out later as I go and I'll figure it out later as I go. And so it was a lot of fun to write and I really enjoyed writing it and it was a lot of fun. And my book that's coming out this October is called Bury Me in Shadows. This is the And that one is um, about a young man who's going to Tulane University in New Orleans and has a bad breakup with his toxic boyfriend and goes on a drug and alcohol binge that winds him up in the hospital. And his mother gives him a choice. You can go stay with your dying grandmother in rural Alabama, or you can go to rehab. So he chooses Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of family legends and a lot of there's uh, the ruins of the old plantation house dealing with the history of the family and the racism of the county and and homophobia in rural Alabama it's based I've loosely based it on where we're actually from only it's not quite I don't think it's quite as rustic and backwards as where I'm from <laughs> where we're actually from and I'm really excited about it I think it's a it's, it's a departure for me and it's there's a supernatural element to ghosts in the woods and things from the from this from the horrible past and horrible crimes in the, of the past come to fruition in the present. It was a lot of fun to write. Cool. What part of Alabama is it, Greg? 
Um, nowhere you'd know. Uh, <laughs> it's a big city. That covers the entire state. Though, right? All right. The, the, the county seat has a population of less than 4,000. Okay. There's no major, it, you'd have to, it, I always tell people it's about an hour and 20 minutes northwest of Tuscaloosa. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And if you're on Highway 20 coming in from Mississippi, you get off at Carbon Hill and drive for 45 miles. It, it literally is in the middle of nowhere. It's Fayette and, County. Fayette County. And, is and not stop for gas. Do not, do not <laughs> stop for gas. Do not stop for oh. gas. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I need to stop to see if we have any questions since we're at 746. <laughs> yes. Do we have questions? How will I know if we have questions? <laughs> Oh, hey, Michael. Um, no questions yet that I'm seeing, but I will. I will let you know if we have any questions. So, well, I see one. Oh, one person oh, right there. Right there. Oh. Okay, let me check. Because um, I have questions. I have more questions. Do you? Um, okay, I can't tell where the question is in that. So let me. <laughs> Oh, here it is. Here it is. I have a lot of trouble. This is from Dad Pierce. I have a lot of trouble introducing my characters. Some critiques seem to want to know everything right to birth order on the first page. Um, my main character, the most recent endeavor, happens to be gay. He's older, isn't in a relationship, and has any specific event that needs calling out his sexuality. It becomes apparent necessary near the midpoint. But I'm more into plot than Ark since he is of the lone detective trope. When should their sexuality come into play? Mm. Okay, so that's an interesting question, which sort of um, gets into something I was thinking about, which is, <laughs> um, and uh, we'll we'll get the we'll we'll try to wrap this in, but. Um, you know, my last panel here was called Mysteries with a Mission, which talked about um, mystery writers who use social issues as a backdrop for their mysteries, um, like transphobia, homophobia, racism, and so forth. And in those mysteries, of course, the um, sort of the identity of the protagonist as an outsider belonging to one of those groups is front and central. Um, do you... And listening to all of you, I mean, I think that uh, being queer is fairly central to um, your character's identity. Um, do you think of yourself as mission-driven writers? I, I don't. Um, uh, I, I look at it this way because, you know, this is the first book in the Jinx Blue series out of four that really dealt with the issue of transphobia. Um, and so I look at it this way, um, my character's uh, gender identity being trans um, shapes her experience of the world, but it doesn't define her experience of the world. Um, in the same way that my uh, Shay Stevens uh, uh, character, Outlaw Biker, she's, she's a lesbian, uh, but her being lesbian doesn't define who she is, but it shapes who she interacts with, um, it shapes um, how she experiences the world. And so I don't think it's necessary to uh, really focus on their queerness per se. Um, but um, I mean, it's okay if you want to. I mean, uh, you can have them in a relationship if that's what you want, but um, you don't have to necessarily have it be their defining factor. And you know, you could just have it the have it brought up in the subtle ways in which we, you know, we experience our queerness in our daily lives. You know, I'm not always going out saying, I'm trans, I'm trans, I'm trans. Are you trans? Mm -hmm. Um, but every once in a while it pops up and you know, someone maybe I'll hear someone talk about an issue related to the queer community and my thought process, whether I say anything or not, my thought process is, oh, okay, I could say this about my experience or I could not. So, I mean, it, in introducing a character, maybe they 
think about something, even if they're not in a relationship or, or their queerness is not a central part of the story. So um, I want to ask PJ this question. I just finished reading Bathhouse, which is a great book, by the way. I highly recommend it. But um, so you talked about Oliver's, you know, experiences in this small town in Indiana, I think it is, in Indiana. Correct. And um, you talk about his shame and how um, this, his shame and his guilt. Um, do you think that that's a specifically gay trope or could Oliver have been Olivia? Would it have been the same book? I think sort of at a, at a very basic uh, level, shame is a, a emotion that human, like I, I, I think we only have a, a finite repertoire of emotions that all of us as humans, regardless of where we come from, access, including shame and pain and love and sadness and betrayal and all those and all those kinds of things. But within the context of a story like um, like this, it would have been it would have been wildly um, different. Um, the stakes would have been different um, in different ways. The conflict would have uh, taken a different shape. Um, mm -hmm. As as uh, Olivia is that <laughs> <laughs> Olivia as Benson? <laughs> as Olivia, Be <laughs> if Liv Benson was navigating the story, it would also be radically different. <laughs> um, but uh, but no, because uh, normalization. If Oliver was a cis white het woman, um, society would have space. Um, for 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 that character um, to uh, that character's life is normalized at all at mm -hmm. all levels, okay. and when it. when shitty things happen, um, that's the starting place. And yet, for a character like Oliver, that's not the starting place because you know that's not a normalized behavior. Why the hell are you at a bathhouse? Um, you know, uh, seeking anonymous sex, feeding into gay tropes or you know whatever else um any of the characters might cat you know might say uh about that behavior um and and so no i think if olivier was almost you know in the same exact situation um almost murdered at a bat a bathhouse i guess i don't i don't <laughs> uh, uh and you know cheating on her husband um there there would be that compulsion uh i would assume perhaps um to hide uh, to hide that fact, um, but I don't think there would be the same conversations in front of a police officer, um, mm -hmm. uh, certainly, um, and also a, a willingness to maybe write it off as that. Um, if a bunch of people die in a bathhouse, um, is that going to make the news? Is that going to get someone fired in law enforcement, or is that going to result in an election upset in in some sort of positive way um i would like to to think so and i don't also think so um so it would be an entirely different story uh, oh. but the feeling the feeling is is the same um even though those characters would would maybe get to it in different ways um and deal with the fallout quite differently that's a very illuminating answer uh, what about you cheryl do you think of yourself as a mission-driven writer or that that part of your um, task as a writer is to highlight racism, homophobia, or as in one of your novels, homelessness, to deal with those issues? I absolutely do feel that responsibility. And every book I write is going to talk about race, tolerance, class, and justice, and how it affects people who are not rich and famous and privileged. I'm always going to write those kind of books. Like like Dharma, there's gonna be some shooting and killing and car chasing. <laughs> but I, you know, I think uh, a protagonist who is black, queer, and female is a political act in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I think yeah. when she goes out yes. the door and walks down the street, she's making a political statement. Um, and so I don't think as a as, as a black queer woman, I can afford to to not address those issues, um, and in a way that entertains but edifies um, and helps bring people along. So I'm, I, I almost always have a picture of a person in my mind when I'm writing the book and it's not a black person. You know, it's a white person who needs to hear this stuff because black people know it. 
<laughs> what about it, Greg? What do you think? Um, I think there, I mean, it can go either way for me. Um, I've dealt with a lot of, you know, homophobic, homophobia based trauma <laughs> in my life. And so there are times when I'm writing that I do want to deal with the, those issues. I want to deal with class. I want to deal with racism. I want to deal with homophobia. I want to deal with misogyny. I mean, that was really what I was trying to get to the bottom of in Royal Street Revion was the misogyny about the housewives and how they're treated and how women are looked at in those contexts. I don't know if I actually was able to do that properly or not, but that was what I was, the goal was. But with Scotty, I my mentality behind Scotty when I created him was I wanted to create a gay man who had no issues with being gay whatsoever. His parents are completely accepting of him. He came out to them when he was a teenager. His parents embraced him, joined PFLAG. His parents are hippie stoners who live in the quarter who, uh, you know, have, have the money to be able to be stoner hippies who live in the <laughs> quarter. And um, so so sometimes it, it comes up in the Scotty books. It de I deal with it a lot more in the Chance books because I see them as more darker. I don't want to, the Scotty books, I always want to be, I see those more, they need to be wacky and funny and ridiculous. But the nice thing about writing books that are set in New Orleans is wacky and ridiculous is every day here. <laughs> I mean, every day there's material. <laughs> there's always material i've been reading a lot of history lately about new orleans because i'm, I'm wanting to write something in the past some, something said in the past and it's been fascinating finding how far back the an openly gay trans only it wasn't called that then mm -hmm. community existed in new orleans and how far back it goes it goes back to the 1800s i mean there were gay bars in the french quarter in the 1800s yeah which you know is fascinating storyville the process the houses of the Houses of ill repute in Storyville, all the madams, if they needed, if they had a customer who wanted a guy, they knew where to send the bouncer to go get one who would do it. And I think that's fascinating. And it's history that's lost, that doesn't really get talked about much, that doesn't get written about much. And I think it's kind of, I'm off topic completely. Off <laughs> so actually, I think. Kevin, are we almost out, out of time here? Um, well, we can keep going if you all would like to. We have, we do have two questions and a request. Okay, what's the request? Uh, well, the request is for you. They would like to hear about your yes. work. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <my laughs> <book is. laughs> okay. Yay. Yay. So uh, I write. Uh, I've written a series of. Um, novels with uh, a gay Mexican-American criminal defense lawyer named Henry Rios. And um, I, my books are very much uh, driven by um, a sense of mission. And, um, but I also recognize that because I chose to write mysteries, my first obligation is to tell a story that uh, keeps the readers turning that page. So I'm not a sociologist, I don't write polemics, um, but I do specifically write about issues that affect um, the gay community, queer community. In Lies with Man, I go back to 1986 in Los Angeles when there was an initiative on the California ballot that would have allowed county health officials to quarantine people who are HIV positive into these sort of concentration camps. Um, and that's an actual historical event. And there was also um, within the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, a group of evangelical Christians who were uh, proselytizing within the department in violation of their oaths and, you know, the First Amendment, um, and really pushing a fairly radical Christian agenda. So, um, you know, I write about things that piss me off, and um, there's no shortage of them if you're yes. a queer <laughs> person of <Yes>. color. <laughs> <laughs> so that's me. Now, let's see. Uh, Thank you. Um, I can read uh, the questions if you'd like. Okay. 
Great. Okay. Uh, we have one from Stacy Miller. This is not a queer related question, but would love to hear the authors describe the benefits and difficulties associated with writing in a series versus a standalone. Um, I've only written a series. So. <laughs> <laughs> I've Someone never else. written a series. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine the degree of difficulty is about the same, frankly. Every every book I start, it's like I've never written a book before. <laughs> and it's like reinventing the will. That's well, true. For me though, there there are the continuity issues that I have to mm -hmm. keep up with. That oh, yeah. yeah. You have to be a little more organized when you get about four yeah. books into a series so that you don't miss uh and so i'm doing profiles of all the characters so i can remember their personalities what cars they drive you know mm -hmm. their, their idiosyncrasies because you know mystery readers are discerning and they'll say mm -hmm. charlie didn't have a white corvette mm -hmm. in the second book yes. she had oh a yeah they will corvette, you know? oh yeah so but dharma and greg you don't write standalones but you alternate series <laughs> so how how is that um, I do do standalones too, oh. uh, <laughs> but um, oh, in, the, in your bath oeuvre, of course you do. I do and everything. Short stories, yeah. and short stories, yeah. But for me, it's continuity. Like Cheryl said, it's continuity, and I meant to be better organized about that stuff. <laughs> and then you get six or seven books in and you're like, Jesus Christ, I can't go back and reread all of these books. But but ebooks make it easier because you can search yeah. <laughs> without having to page through. Right, right. So but I've I've made I've made this especially with the Scotty series because it's so fly by the seat of my pants. I've I've made colossal colossal continuity errors but i've always managed to explain my way out of them <laughs> <laughs> i always think of it like the the letters to the comic books in the back where they would catch the continuity errors in marvel <laughs> comics and then the editors right. would explain it that's kind of how i see it <laughs> scotty scotty's mother's name changed <laughs> <laughs> that's really good yeah I, th I think for me uh, i mean the continuity is a is a big challenge and i've i've had a lot of uh i've tried to maintain kind of a story bible to keep track of a lot of the stuff you know what car they drive what kind of weapon they carry um you know how they're related and who's still alive who's dead because you don't want to <laughs> bring back a character it's like didn't he die in book two <laughs> um but, it was a um, sequence. <laughs> the, the other the other challenge that i find is trying to keep it fresh and not rehash uh, the yeah. same old kind of plot devices over and over again so i'm always like you know when i um create a new jinx blue series it's like okay where is this fugitive hiding what are they doing to keep from being arrested and then what is jinx going to have to do in order to track this person down and so it's it is like writing a whole it just it's like starting over from scratch again mm -hmm. it's like because you don't want to just be so formulaic that it's just like okay yeah she's going to be hiding with her boyfriend in the so, mountains and then she's going to go to da, 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 da. um so trying to keep it fresh in that sense uh is my biggest challenge but on the plus side is uh with a series you have a little bit more, and this is the business person in me talking, you have a little bit more read through so that, um, you know, when, when you find a reader that falls in love with your main character, they're more than likely going to read the next book in the series and the next book and the next book. Whereas with the standalone, okay, we, we really love this character. When's it? Oh, no, who's this yeah. other character? Oh, oh, I was hoping for another. So there's not as much of a read through um, with standalones. Also, speaking of that, <laughs> after Royal Street Revillon came out, somebody emailed me and asked me how many car accidents has Scotty actually been in? <laughs> and my response was, that's why he hates driving. <laughs> I know I'm having to keep track of scars and bodily damage. It's like, wait a minute. Okay. I love the comment uh, below in the chat function that was like, dream sequence. Yeah. <laughs> Dharma, you when you were shot JR. <laughs> yeah, when you were talking about, I don't remember who's alive. Um, so I, in my mind, I was like, how would you explain that away? And that pops up. I'm like, that's a great, there you go. Write the, pre write the prequel. 
So Kevin, <laughs> we have another question out there? Um, yeah, and we actually have two more. Okay, so uh, the first part of this question is for PJ and then the second part is for everyone. For PJ, how did you decide on the cover design of your book? And then same question for everyone else. If you um, could pick one of your books and share an anecdote about how you decided on the cover design. Yeah, the answer for me is really easy. I did not uh, <laughs> at all, but I'm, I'm very thankful that I didn't have a chance to do so um, because I don't have, my brain isn't wired that way um, to be able to look at a story and, and really come up with an idea that, um, that pops and, you know, isn't, isn't intuitive. So in my mind, I was like, oh, it's like bathhouse. There's going to be like humidity on glass and it's going to be all fogged up and uh, wherever I, I'm guessing everyone else's mind would have, would, would go immediately. Um, and so that's, what's the, the great thing about working um, or being able having the privilege of working with um, a cover designer who is an artist who can interpret the story through the lens, uh, through their lens. Um, and so John Fontana uh, Doubleday created something that just, it, it took my breath away um, with, with the pink spray painted X and, and also the neck, which is a very, mm. um, a very primal, a, I've got sort of a medical background in a past life. It's, it's tiger territory. When you start sticking right. things in here, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it becomes dangerous and a lot riskier. Um, but it's also, there's a sensuality and a sexuality uh, sort of there, that, you know, it conjures those things when we think about like the neck because it, it, there's the vulnerability. And so I, I'm, in, I'm in love with, with the cover and I feel like I, I feel weird on, on one side for saying that because I'm like, it's my book and I shouldn't, you know, I, I just, it's so great. I love it so much. But, uh, yeah. but at the same time, it is someone else's art. Um, and I could not be prouder that that's what Bathhouse looks like. And that's what um, readers yeah. will think of uh, when, when they think of the book because it's, it's, it's a very, very striking cool. cover. It really it is. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Th th thank you. And, and so, <laughs> so, John, if, if <laughs> the cover's amazing. Thank, thank you. There it is. There it is. Yeah. There it is. Easy answer. It, it, my my cover would have been made in PowerPoint, um, and it would not have looked like that at all. So. I actually did design the cover for Turf Wars. Um, I come from a. Let's I, see I, it again. You no. have it. Yeah, I don't. I don't actually have it with me right now. I'm very unprepared. I know, very unprofessional of me. Um, but um, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not a professional cover designer, but I do come from a graphic design background. Uh, my mother was a professional graphic designer, so I kind of grew up watching her work and and everything. And so um, I'm really proficient. I'm for for an amateur. I'm proficient in uh, Photoshop. So um, I drew on, I, for my first three books in the series, I hired a cover designer who did a great job for those books. But being an independent author myself, um, it's expensive uh, to hire a cover designer. Uh, so um, I decided to, to try my hand at it and it turned out really well. I just kind of drew on uh, kind of the colors that I, I wanted to bring into it, um, bringing in the, the image of the desert um, and of course, the, the image of uh, um, Jinx with the, with the gun. So the girl with the gun cover, you know, you can't go wrong with that. <laughs> Carol, you, does oh. Anne McMahon do your covers? She does. And I want to get one of my favorite ones, which is this. I mean, she she's a brilliant designer. She's yeah. also a brilliant writer. Um, yeah. This is the Auto Show one. And I usually I will, she will have the synopsis. She'll read it. And she's... I almost don't have to tell her what to put on now. Um, so this is the one about the auto show and it's conspiracy and it's murder and domestic terrorism. And she came up with this cover. And I mean, I think it invokes enough mystery that you want to want to buy it. She's very good and very collaborative. Treehouse Studios is the the name of her company. Nice. She also did the covers of my of my uh, the latest edition of uh, Rio's. And this is my favorite, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. Burn, I love that cover. Which yeah, is set in cover. San Francisco in the 70s and 80s. This is yeah. actually a photograph from Polk Street that I licensed from the San Francisco Public Library. Thank oh, you. Hey. <laughs> and then I gave it to Anne, and she did this just amazing color thing. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. She's, she's really great. And an award, and a Lambda Award winning writer, also. That's right. Who does your covers, Greg? 
Well, when I was my original publishers, you know, it was always just, well, here's your cover. Right. <laughs> so, hope right. you like it. But, you know, I, I've been really lucky in that I've liked all of my covers. I know there are some authors who've never been really happy with their covers. This was my first Scotty cover. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Truth yeah. in advertising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually kind of shocked when they sent it to me. I was like, seriously? Yeah, we're going to get it on tables in Barnes & Noble. Okay. <laughs> all right. <laughs> but now that I'm with Bold Strokes, they're, they really work with me on the covers. Um, I am not a graphic designer. I had a job where I had to learn graphic design on the job when I ran a, was the editor of a magazine 20 years ago. You remember Lambda Book Report, Michael. Oh, uh, yeah. I was the editor and I had to learn on the job how to do covers and how to do layout and design and all of that. It was Quark and was the design program, which I don't oh, even yeah. think exists anymore. And it was not user friendly <laughs> at all and but i've been really really lucky with bold strokes they'll send me like 10 different cover choices they they'll have me send them what i they have me at they have me tell them what i want and then they send me 10 options and then i end up oh i like this part and i like this part and i like this font and i like this and i like this and then they'll put it all together i've been very very lucky on that regard so i have a lot more at bold strokes i have a lot more say in the cover and if i don't want i've never actually rejected any of the options that they've sent me there have been i probably have made some bad choices that didn't sell the book the way i should that where i thought oh that's a great cover for the book because that's exactly what the story is but it didn't sell the book so but yeah it is what it is let's do that last question and then i'm going to ask each of you to name three queer mystery writers that people should be reading. And then I guess we'll sign off. So what's the last question here, Kevin? Okay, here it is. I've often heard it said that sci-fi is an ideal queer genre because it explores otherness and alternate views of reality, which is an everyday queer experience, even in the present. Do you think that mystery crime is also particularly queer because it deals with injustice, hidden lives and identities? tension in relationships and secrets that can stay secret is there some commonality you have seen among queer mystery writers that is distinct from straight writers those are great questions so signing off now (laughs) (laughs) i I I don't have a complicated relationship with the truth so not at all Never, never held a secret in my life. And I've right? never felt like an outsider in any sort of never. <laughs> never. I, I do like the new, you know, the, the world building in sci-fi and the, especially with the young adult audience and the, the young writers now who are doing sci-fi and their ability to just um, take gender identity and morph it into so many unique and wonderful expressions of characters. I think there's some fabulous work being done in the YA market around sci-fi, oh, queer Octa- sci-fi. Octavia Butler alone. And, and <laughs> there's the old school sci-fi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, trans, trans writers doing speculative and sci-fi fiction are also oh, incredible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it's, like so, it's so obvious that, yeah, in the future, gender fluidity will be like a thing. You yeah. know, Isaac Asimov didn't think of this. He saw this character smoking cigarettes in the 25th <laughs> century. <laughs> right. Yeah, Mallory Cooper is a uh, trans uh, sci-fi writer who is, she's like one of the most prolific writers that I, I know personally. And she her work is just absolutely amazing. And I'll mention so, KT Ayton and Barbara Ann Wright, who both do sci-fi. And yeah. I'll mention Calvin Gimelditch. Gimelditch. Calvin Gimelditch, who's a really wonderful writer. Um, so, okay. Three, three queer mystery writers that everyone should be reading. So I'm, I'm going to start with Joseph Hansen, Catherine Forrest, and Ellen Hart. Those are my three choices. Oh, yeah. Yeah, those are good. Uh-huh. I'm going to go with um, Eddie Boudel-Tan, who is another uh, Canadian author in Vancouver who wrote After Elias and has The Rebellious Tide coming out, um, I believe, in August, um, which is just a gripping story, uh, sort of inspired by, uh, in some ways, the German Wings tragedy that occurred. So it's, it's you know, what is, how, how do, 
how does a queer uh, a queer couple grieve um, in, in the wake of something uh, like that? Um, also, uh, John Fram's uh, The Brightlands is a, an amazing horror gothic uh, story. He's got something great that he's cooking up that's coming out, and I really, really loved um, Micah Never Never Ever's um, these uh, violent delights about sort of the eruptive um, relation, like when, when young people are in love um, and they're not supposed to be uh, and how fraught that is in any situation, but it's certainly fraught, fraught as hell when society says they shouldn't be together and then how that finds outlets is, is a very powerful book. So um, uh, those are three for me. Cool. Dharma. Uh, let's see, Robin Geigel, who's- uh, uh, I just met her. Yeah, she's amazing. Uh, she's her great. debut thriller, uh, legal thriller, um, uh, By Way of Sorrow. Uh, and she's got a, a second one coming out, um, I think later this year. Yeah, Kensington. Yes, yes. Um, also Brad Shreve, uh, he wrote Body in the Bathhouse and a Body on a Hill. And I think he's got a third one coming out, although I can't remember the name of that one. Uh, his really, really great stories. Um, and uh, Kristen Lepianka, um, her Roxanne Weary series. Yeah. Greg. Um, J.M. Redmond's Mickey Knight oh, series. Mm -hmm. Dark, hard boiled, fl deeply flawed, deeply. lesbian private eye in New Orleans. Great titles. She, she's also my boss. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sandra Scopitone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Who also did YA also yeah. back in the 70s before yeah. anyone else really was hmm. and um james robert baker who nobody really seems to talk about much anymore yeah. we talked about him last night on a podcast with Dar me and dharma yeah, okay. um, james robert baker was basically um jim thompson if he was gay and on meth <laughs> <laughs> cheryl what, what who are your three choices well my three are um Crystal Smith, who is a young queer writer, writes spec fiction. Her d debut novel was called Two Moons. I think uh, has the, the, the chops to be the next Octavia Butler. Um, Nikki Baker, who in the 1990s wrote a mystery series, um, the Virginia Kelly series, the first black queer uh, hmm. mystery writer, um, woman mystery writer that I know of, I stand on her shoulders. And then um, someone in our publishing house, Michael, Ann Aptiker, writes a, a series called The Cantor yeah. Series. The writing is lovely. The writing is terrific. It's hard boiled. It's um, set in New York. Um, and I, you should at least pick up one of Ann's books and, and taste it. So thank you all for, uh, I wish we were all together. Yeah. You can all go out. You can all go out and continue this discussion. And thank yeah, you, Kevin. And, um, <laughs> thank you, Claire Johnson, if you're still there. Thank you all for a great conversation, and thanks to our audience and for the, all the questions. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. And happy right. Friday. Thanks for having us. Happy, happy Friday, everybody. Friday. Friday. Thank you, PJ, Dharma, Cheryl. Thank you for coming out. Yay! Buy all these books, everyone. Buy all these books. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thanks for coming. Bye. 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 Bye.